Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody, based on where you're based on the world, and uh, uh, welcome to this session, to our dialogue on the 15-minute city. Uh, my name is Carlo Ratti, I'm a professor at MIT, we run a lab called Sensible City Lab, um, and today we'll talk about the 15-minute city to get, together with Sally Cap, Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne in Australia, with Matt Haig, Chair of the Executive Board at uh, Mott McDonald Group in the UK, and uh, with Arunaba Ghosh, who's founder and CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water uh, in India. So just to begin, uh, let's take a few minutes uh, to talk about the 15-minute city. Well, the 15-minute city has been talked, uh, talked about a lot over the past couple of years, uh, especially you know, in, uh, in circles dealing with uh, planning, with urban planning, with cities, in government. Um, like many things, uh, many reputable things in the world, it has a French origin and name, La Ville du Cardeur. It actually was uh, theorized by Carlos Moreno and Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, uh, uh, over the past couple of years, especially during the pandemic, uh, when we all hoped that uh, our city were a bit closer to us. A 15-minute city is based on the idea that we can build neighborhoods where everything we need, or most of the things we need in our lives, uh, can be reached very quickly. You can describe it as an isochron. An isochron is an area that you can reach within, as the name says, within 15 minutes in this case. And so you can think about the city as kind of a fractal organism where we've got different neighborhoods, 15 minute neighborhoods that uh, together, piece together a bigger city as a fractal, again, in a fractal way. Now, the 15 million city has been discussed a lot, it's been followed in many cities as a principle, it's been now followed in, uh, in many uh, planning um, you know, initiatives around the planet. Um, recently, we've also seen a few more critical voices uh, about the 15 million city, about the challenges. You know, clearly, if you were to do a merely 15 million city, so if people were not to go out of the 15 million bubble, we could also increase segregation, or somehow, you know, a 15 million city would become then the equivalent of a village. The city itself is, uh, is also the richness that happens beyond the 15 minutes. Having said that, you know, that's uh, just as a simple framing for, uh, for, for the concept, really, uh, I wanted to start by asking Sally, uh, Lord Mayor of Melbourne, as I said, Sally, you know, your, your city, first of all, is usually in the top ranking globally in terms of quality of life. And your city has been promoting over the years a concept quite similar to the 15-minute city. You know, looking at neighborhood, 20-minute neighborhoods, and, uh, and again, you know, similar principles of what we're discussing today. So uh, perhaps could elaborate on that, and how do you see uh, that the, your approach to planning over the past uh, 20, 30 years in Melbourne has helped make it more livable? Thanks, Carlo. It's an honour to join you on this panel today and to talk about 15-minute cities. I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from today. We are proud that Melbourne has had a long history of being recognised as one of the most livable cities in the world, but it's not something that we've achieved by chance. In fact, three decades ago, we were described as a moribund city in a rust bucket state. Since then, we've been very thoughtful and deliberate about the way that we design our city spaces to drive aspirational economic, social and environmental outcomes for our community. There are a number of very intentional factors that contribute to this. We are devotees of mixed use communities and planning schemes that support the co-location of work, live and play, uh, and that underpins our 20-minute city. We do prioritise active and public transport infrastructure so that people can easily walk or catch public transport to the services they need to work and, of course, to recreation. And we note that about 90% of the trips done around our CBD are done by four we cherish unique local character and really uh, do our best to make sure that um, we've promoted uh, local economies and, and, and support them to flourish. We foster opportunities for people of all ages, backgrounds and abilities to be able to connect and engage, which is one of the reasons why we're renowned as a, as a festival and event city as well. And we like to plot adaptability and sustainability into every decision we make so that our city and our people are ready to meet current and future challenges. 
We remain committed, Carlo, to measuring ourselves against the global standards. Um, and we were the first city in Australia to pledge to report our progress against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I was dismayed to read uh, from the World Economic Forum that in 2020, the first year in a long time, that we've seen a backward step in the achievement of the SDGs. And uh, we know that the COVID crisis has impacted uh, many uh, cities and their ability to keep driving those goals forward. But we want to use the crisis, as many do, as a catalyst to improving the adaptability of our city by going to the next level and planning for each of our neighbourhoods um, to be very distinctive in their 20-minute uh, um, identity. Over the past year, we've made great strides in cementing our reputation as a livable city. One more minute, Carlo. We've fast-tracked the delivery of 44 kilometres of protected bicycle lanes. We've endorsed an affordable housing strategy and set up an entity to make sure we have more affordable housing, particularly for key workers. And we're turning uh, our Yarra waterfront uh, into a lush, uh, and lively public realm for kilometres of new public open space. And we're using our urban forest strategy to increase our canopy cover. All of those things are elements of what we are doing to maintain our livable status, but also to enshrine our 20 minute status. And uh, we believe it's now more important than ever that we create connected, cohesive cities full of possibility. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. And you know, what you said, especially you know, the mixed-use developments to, to combine different functions in the neighbourhood is, is vital if you want to have neighbourhoods where within a 15-minute walk or bike ride, we can reach all the th most of the things we need in life. Um, and homogenous but is boring, Carlo, anyway. Absolutely. And, and, and also, you know, when you mix things, you, you, that, that allows you to use much better space as well because you, things compensate over time. So it allows you to schedule better the city. And that's one of the things I, I always admire in, uh, in Melbourne, how rich and always present uh, urban life, public life is. But going from, from, uh, from Melbourne, I wanted to ask Mike, uh, um, Mike you know, uh, with your company, you're consulting with governments, uh, especially city govern governments globally. So how do you see this idea being? Being uh, developed and being uh, being um, kind of uh, used by by cities in different parts of the planet. Yeah, no, good question. I, you know, I think the answer to that, in some ways, would have been different 18 months ago. I do think that COVID is, um, has has made a difference. You know, people talk about pandemics as being great accelerators of trends that were um, already happening. And um, and if you think of you know the climate emergency. If you think of social outcomes as a response to inequality, these things have all accelerated, I think, in the last 18 months. So that's good because I think there's a driver. I think there's a very clear driver around them um, 15 minutes. It is, you know, um, we're seeing social outcomes, we're seeing social outcomes coming to the fore in our clients' thinking kind of all over the place. And, you know, whether, and it's not always about the, the, the cities per se, it might be about improving resilience to physical impacts of climate change, you know, that we're seeing. Um, across the globe in Southeast Asia, for example. Um, you know, providing rapid um, public transport to less advantaged communities in places like Los Angeles. So I could give the, uh, the list kind of goes on, but, but this social change thing, I think, is acting as a, um, as, as a driver. I do think it's pretty clear that developing 15-minute cities requires a really deep and broad understanding of, um, of the sort of transformations that we um, that might be maybe required, and um, and you know, and that's not straightforward. It's 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 complex, and certainly in in our roles, planners and, um, and and engineers, making these transformations real really requires a, a, an in depth understanding. And um, and and I do think, and I'll touch on data in, in a minute as well. But I think data is part of this trying to make sense of that complexity. You know, we've got a great advantage nowadays with digital technology to be able to use data to make sense of, um, of, of what's going on. Um, you know, Sally already talked about the, the merits of 15-minute um, minutes, minutes cities, and, and, you know, I, I guess they're clear and they're, um, they're, they're well rehearsed. And, of course, there's the big environmental and health benefits that, um, that, that they bring as, as, as well. But, but there are challenges. You know, and Carlos, you, you touched on this, Carlos, you touched on this, that there are real challenges. I think recognizing 
that local differences are, um, are fundamental is, um, is, is really important. And those differences from city to city, from country to country, but also, you know, within a, um, within a city, there isn't a 15 minute city kind of blueprint um, that will work everywhere. And, um, and so we really need to make sure that we treat each city, each neighborhood, each community um, in, a, in a different different way. I think as, as we've been involved in, um, in, in this, there are some, you know, kind of despite the differences, there are some really important, useful kind of common goals. And, um, and again, yeah, I, I, I think these, um, these came out in the discussion about Melbourne. But I think firstly, you know, livable and sustainable cities need to promote equality of access and opportunity from, you know, from people from different sections of society. Um, you know, maybe that's obvious, but it's not always um, e easy to do. I think sec secondly, you know, the pandemic has, has definitely highlighted the importance of building kind of res social resilience um, around those um, social inequalities. And, and thirdly, I already mentioned the, the climate emergency and, um, and, and the demands, you know, that that, um, that that brings. We often hear people talk about building back better and building back greener, certainly here in the UK. You know, these are, um, these are well rehearsed terms. Um, but delivering on them is um, is, is, is somewhat um, somewhat different. So I guess that um, you know, as engineers and planners, we we know that it's a, a massive challenge to transform all already kind of densely populated cities and, and cities with um, kind of established land use and um, and established transport cities, so the transport systems. And and I suppose we also recognise that there are real concerns that you know some of these models for planning can. You know they can they they can do more harm than good. They can really alienate already marginalised um, uh, communities. So any transformation really needs to to take into account. You know um, it needs to take all these things into account and, and be planned carefully and maybe done in an e evolutionary sort of um, so, sort of manner. I mentioned digital earlier, and um, you know one thing that that, that that we talk a lot about is is um, a kind of triple access type type model to um, to developing. 15 minute cities where we're not just talking about kind of physical mobility and spatial proximity, but we're also talking about digital connectivity. And that, that's another reason why the pandemic has, has changed things a, a, a lot. People aren't just thinking about access to whatever it might be now, um, whether through, you know, the locality or, or, or that um, physical mobility, but, but digital connectivity. So that's something we could perhaps um, touch on at, um, at, at some point as, as, as well. So, you know, in the, just to finish off, I mean, in the UK, you know, we're, um, we're working, you know, on, um, on with several cities in, in, in terms of um, uh, creating this 15 or 20 minute um, cities. We're doing this with Birmingham at the moment. And, um, and there's no doubt that, you know, that, that Birmingham's a good, um, a, a good candidate. There are many things that, that, that it has in its favour, including a, 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 a quite a dense um, transport network, which, um, which certainly, certainly helps. But all of those challenges that I've talked about in the last sort of two or three minutes have absolutely um, come to the fore, you know, in, in, in terms of um, doing the consultation around, um, um, around Birmingham. So... You know, this isn't this isn't straightforward. It's complex and um, and requires a deep understanding of um, of the cities, the communities, the neighbourhoods that you're um, that you're working with. Thank you, thank, thank you, Mag. And just just a quick thing. You know, you talked about density, and if you look at Birmingham or Paris or uh, you know Melbourne, there's certainly critical density. Also, some of the cities traditionally were already organized around neighborhoods. But, you know, do you think you could transform, say, Los Angeles with very low density, such, such a spread, such a sprawl? Could it be transforming into a 15-minute walking city? I, I, it's like I said, there's no blueprint, is there? I don't think there's any blueprint. You know, we, I was but do you think it's London. possible? But do you think it's possible? I think, I think, I think anything is possible as long as you, you, you recognize some of these key kind of goals around, around being careful that you, that you promote equality and you don't actually generate inequality accidentally almost. So yes, I think, I think you can do it, but I think um, you need to flex the model. Um, you know, I was talking to someone about London recently and, and how London actually is a whole series of specialist centers, you know, the West End for media and the city of London for, um, uh, for, for finance and, and, and so on. I think you need to sometimes work with what you've got rather than trying to impose what might 
feel like an ideal solution. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And well, you know, um, Arunba, um, what about the global south? You know, your experience in India, uh, for, for, do, do you see, how do you see the same concept being, uh, you know, viable in, uh, in the global south? And also more generally, you know, inequality can be a big issue. I'm thinking about some Indian cities. And so is it going to increase inequality if we think about cities with these kind of neighborhoods and people stay mostly in the neighborhoods, but then, you know, the rich may stay more in one neighborhood and, you know, the poor in another one. So what's your take on it? Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Carlo. I hope you can hear me. And uh, many thanks for having me on this panel. I think what you've touched upon is very important because ultimately, whether it's a 15-minute city or a 50-minute city, it really depends on you know how you bring that diversity into where you live, where you work, and where you go for entertainment. But one of the things that is common across the global south is the nature in which the urbanization is unfolding. Of course, if you look at, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, you have about half the population which is urbanized. But if you look at Latin America, that number grows up to 85%. For South Asia, it's under 50% right now. So the question for us is what is the kind of city and what is the kind of urbanization we will then adopt as we become more urbanized, right? Um, and let's take transport for a second, because that's, I think, at the heart of bringing that equity question um, into city design. Again, in Africa, you have about um, 40 to 50% of um, transport being, is basically non-motorized, it's walking or cycling. In uh, Latin America, again, it can be um, uh, fairly high, depending on how the city has been designed. But in Asia, where I reside, um, you know, there are uh, some parts of India, for instance, where you know, 60% of urban trips are basically non-motorized. And yet developed Asia, like Singapore or South Korea, um, you have very low shares of non-motorized transport. So effectively what you're doing is the way you're designing a transport system can uh, bring communities of different sort of income groups closer together or can widen the disparity. One more thing that, is, that matters here, I would say, in thinking this through is the actual kind of lack of capacity. I mean, if you take Australia and, and you know, what Sally was talking about, you have about uh, you know, 20 or town planners per 100,000 population. In um, a lot of the developing world, in Africa and Asia, that number could be as low as five. So now, what is the town planner doing? Is, is the town planner merely just kind of getting roads built out and buildings built out? Or the, do you have the capacity to think about that integrated uh, work, life, entertainment story along with equity at the heart of it? Another dimension that will be critical on the equity front will be how we deal with uh, elements of the negative uh, uh, sort of environmental externalities. Uh, whether you take air pollution, whether you take how waste is treated, whether you take how waste is disposed, whether you look at even uh, indoor cooking fuels, these are things that developed world, the developed world perhaps does not have to deal with so much. But in the developing world, these have a big impact in the kinds of areas of the city that are more polluted than others, the kinds of population that are exposed to these negative externalities versus those who are living in greener enclaves. So I would simply say if you focus on the transportation side, if you focused on building up the city planning capacity, and if we focused on mitigating those negative environmental externalities, then I think we can build 15-minute cities, but which are also more equitable than otherwise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aruna. Um, there's a question from the audience I'm seeing here that I'd like to ask you, and, uh, you know, it's about how to remodel unplanned cities. And here I believe that the audience means, uh, whoever asked the question means, you know, informality. There's a lot of informality in the global south. So, so where do you start in that case? I think that's a very important question, especially on the last issue I talked about, about waste, right? There's a huge informal waste management 
system in many cities of the developing world. Now, you, if you just overnight replace it with a so-called you know, top-down model, then you're actually effectively kicking out you know, tens of thousands of people out of employment and not necessarily guaranteeing a cost-optimal approach. Now, how do you bring that into your city planning? That goes to the heart of how you build a circular economy in the developing South, right? Yeah. Um, so how does kind of more advanced technology for waste management integrate with a very labor-intensive waste collection system, right? Um, which does not exclude an entire part of the, of the, of the city or yeah. all of the city's workforce. Thank you. So I think, again, the, the, it cannot be only an engineered solution. It has to be a lot more collaborative. From the south. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would say somehow it seems to me you're saying you need to embrace informality and then from there try to uh, upgrade and improve the city. We've got a couple of minutes, still a couple of minutes. There's another question for the audience I'd like to ask. Maybe this can be shared between Mike and Sally. And the question is, what are the barriers to implementing the 15-minute city? And how can it be financed? And I wonder maybe, Mike, if you could comment just in 30 seconds on the barriers. You mentioned it before, but you know, if in, a, in a nutshell. And then Sally, maybe on the financing of it. We've got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, I, I think that the, the barriers we've kind of talked about, I, I think you, you have to embrace the um, informality that we, um, that, that, um, we just um, dis discussed. And I think embrace the... Um, the fact that you know there will be different solutions for um, for, for, for different cities, I think, and, and Sally can talk about the detail of the financing. But but financing is also kind of critical because clearly private sector investment is um, is a big part of um, any um, city development, and certainly when you start looking at 15 mini cities, it's it's massively relevant. But you've got to be really careful that that investment isn't attracted into those places that are more advantaged, perhaps, than, than other places. So to try and get private sector investment into less advantaged areas um, is, is, is tricky. And then it all also starts to be, you know, um, you know as Dr. Dosh was talk, talking about, the, the issues with how those transport links work so that you can actually have, have cross-community transport links between the less um, the 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 the, the, um, the uh, less advantaged areas and the, and the more advantaged areas. I'm trying Thank to go. You. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Sally. Yes. You... Uh, the financing uh, can be very challenging because uh, to have great twenty-minute suburbs, the public realm and public infrastructure needs to be delivered and delivered well. Uh, the uh, financing will normally come from usual levers, um, most of which start with a T, tax of some sort. We might call them developer contributions, for example. Uh, they could come from special purpose taxes set up for uh, the infrastructure necessary to develop in certain areas. Uh, and uh, it can come from uh, general purpose purpose taxes, depending on how we are budgeting uh, here at Town Hall or at State Government. What's really important, though, I'm picking up on some of um, Mike's comments, is a balance because actually in, in uh, taking that finance to deliver in the public realm, we also can't make it so expensive that private sector don't want to come in to deliver what is still essential pieces uh, of those urban renewals and those 20-minute suburbs, uh, private dwellings, commercial premises, uh, employment zones, innovation zones, etc. So it's a really fine balance and something we're challenged with at the moment with two new urban renewal precincts we have within the city, uh, but getting Setting those suburbs up for success in the long term has to be the number one priority. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, well, you know, it's now time to wrap up uh, and to close the section. Maybe I'll, um, uh, I'll like to share some of the, the key takeaways for me. The first one is, you know, there's not a single blueprint for the 15-minute city. Every city is different and trying to implement uh, uh, a 15-minute approach in uh, Melbourne, in Paris, in Birmingham, in uh, Los Angeles. We really need to start from the local condition. The second thing that came up is infrastructure is key. So this is about... Uh, uh, waste is about transport, uh, is about uh, bicycle lanes. Uh, 15 minutes, as we said a few times today, is about a 15-minute radius by walking or, or cycling. Um, we also need to pay attention to some of the risks. Uh, primarily, you know, if you just live 
inside a 15 minute bubble, well, we got all the risks of bubble, in particular, the social segregation and all what uh, comes uh, with that. But it seems to me that overall, uh, there's a broad consensus that if we take the 15 minute neighborhood approach, well, they can help make our cities more livable and lovable.